At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, New customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old school basketball to a new school audience. And today we bring you the rest of the story of Tom and Dick Van Arsdale, the highest scoring twins in NBA history. Together, they have scored over 29,000 points in their NBA careers. That is significantly more than any other set of twins that have ever played in the NBA. The next closest are the Lopez twins, who are around 22,000 points together and they are both still active players so they do continue to add to that total now if you listen to last week's episode then you heard part one of the van arsdale story i covered their lives from their early childhood into their high school days and finished off with the end of their college careers at indiana university now it was time to move on to the next phase of their careers as professional basketball players in the nba as the 1965 nba draft was approaching tom and dick secretly hoped that they would end up on the same team but they also knew that there was very little chance of that happening. They had played their entire lives together going all the way back to their fifth grade youth team. They battled almost daily on their driveway court that their father had built for them. In college, they were roommates. They took the same courses, joined the same fraternity. They even both applied and were accepted to law school together, just in case things did not work out in the NBA. They were not only brothers, they were each other's best friend. I think that one of the greatest things to have in life is a friend who has your back. Someone who you can trust implicitly and who is willing to tell you hard truths because they care about you and want only the best for you. If you have someone like that in your life, Consider yourself blessed. And that's exactly what Tom and Dick had in each other. Now it was time for the 1965 draft, and with the very first pick, the New York Knicks drafted Bill Bradley from Princeton University. There were a number of all-star players in that draft. In addition to Bradley, that draft included Gail Goodrich, Rick Barry, Jerry Sloan, Billy Cunningham, and others. Since there were only nine teams in the NBA at the time, each round was much shorter than it is today. In the second round, with the 13th overall pick, the New York Knicks selected Dick Van Arsdale. And right behind him with the 14th pick, the Detroit Pistons selected Tom Van Arsdale. In today's NBA, the 13th and 14th pick are lottery picks, meaning that they would have been picked in the top half of the first round. But back in 1965, those picks were second round picks. So off they went to training camp at the beginning of the fall of 1965. Dick went off to New York with his new bride and Tom, still a bachelor, left for Detroit. Here is where I feel some compassion for Tom. He had a hard time adjusting to life without his brother. He really struggled not having Dick in practice and having that trusted friend to talk to about whatever was going on. He actually left training camp to enroll in law school since he had already been accepted. After a phone call with Dick, he changed his mind again and returned to the Pistons. I mean, that is how bad it was for Tom. He nearly walked away from an NBA career. Now, both started their careers fairly well and moved into starting roles by the middle of their rookie years. It also helped that they got to see each other in New York fairly often. Back then, it was very common for Madison Square Garden to host NBA doubleheaders on a Saturday night. Basically, four of the nine NBA teams, including New York, would play a doubleheader. That means that a fan could see two NBA games for a single ticket. And it was a great way to make money because they often sold out these games. It was common for a team like the Lakers or the Pistons to travel to New York 
York not to play the Knicks, but to play the Royals or the Celtics as part of the doubleheader. So Tom ended up playing in New York a lot, and that gave him the opportunity to catch up with Dick. The other thing that they did together, again, because they did almost everything together, is that they both joined the Indiana Air National Guard. The Vietnam War was still raging, and many of America's young men were being drafted and sent over to Asia to fight. Most NBA players were exempt from being drafted because the US military has a rule that anyone taller than 6 foot 6 was deemed too tall for the military and a potential liability on the battlefield. But the Van Arsdales were 6 foot 5, so they were very much eligible. By joining the Air National Guard, it allowed them to serve while reducing the chances of having to go to Vietnam. But the commitment required them to train in Indiana one weekend per month and two weeks during the summer. Practically speaking, they missed about five or six games every season due to their military commitment. It also allowed them to be together on those training weekends. Because of their height, they were a bit undersized to play forward in the NBA, so they both would have to go back and forth between playing small forward and shooting guard. They had to develop their guard skills because up until until the NBA, they were both power forwards. In the NBA, they were never superstars. I mean, in today's NBA, 93% of players never become all-stars. But here is a quote by Hall of Famer John Havlicek of the Celtics in describing the Van Arsdale twins. Quote, There were guys playing professional basketball that had more talent than Dick and Tom, but I can't think of many players who played the game any harder than they did. Dick and Tom were a classic example of what happens when someone wants something and works as hard as they can to get it. Unquote. Here is another quote by Hall of Famer Billy Cunningham, quote, They weren't spectacular in the sense that they made amazing plays or excited the crowd with their skill. They just played their tails off. You almost had to be on the court with them to fully appreciate what they did, unquote. At the end of their rookie years, they both made the 1966 NBA All-Rookie Team. Dick had averaged 12 points per game and 5 rebounds. Tom averaged 11 points per game and 4 rebounds. They each had solidified their positions as starters on their respective teams. They were legitimate NBA players with bright futures. Now this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back with the rest of their NBA careers. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the NBA careers of Tom and Dick Van Arsdale. They both continue to play very well and during the middle of their third year the Detroit Pistons had traded Tom to the Cincinnati Royals. It never feels good to be traded away but it meant that Tom would become the starting shooting guard for the Royals alongside his new backcourt teammate and hero Oscar Robertson. For Tom this was a dream come true. If he could not play with his brother at least he could play with his hero. But things would change at the end of that third year for Dick. In the summer of 1968 Two new teams were joining the NBA, the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks. When brand new teams join the NBA, they have something called the Expansion Draft. All of the existing teams can protect up to eight players from that draft. Of course, teams typically protect their best eight players. Anyone not protected can simply be taken by one of the new teams, as long as no more than one player per team is taken. The New York Knicks left Dick unprotected, and while Dick was a good player, the Knicks did not see him as part of the championship team they were building. The Phoenix Suns jumped all over it. They felt that Dick was probably the best unprotected player available and snatched him up in the 
expansion draft, so Dick was now on his way to the Valley of the Sun and became the team's star player instantly. In that first season in Phoenix, which was his fourth season overall, he raised his scoring average from 11 to 21 points per game and made his first All-Star game. Dick very quickly became the most popular player in Phoenix. He played hard, he scored a bunch, and he was great on camera during interviews. Dick was the face of the expansion Phoenix Suns. The following year, 1970, Dick made the All-Star game again, but this time he was joined by Tom, who had made it from the Royals. The coaches thought it would be a lot of fun to have the Twins guard each other in that All-Star game. By their own admission, nobody played tougher defense on them than each other. In 1971, they both made the All-Star game again. They both had solidified their reputation as stars in the NBA. Not superstars, but stars nonetheless, because after all, most players never even reached that status. In 1972, only Tom made the All-Star game that year, but that gave each of them three All-Star appearances. Eventually, the Cincinnati Royals relocated to Kansas City, where they renamed themselves the Kansas City Omaha Kings. They played 21 of their home games in Kansas City and played 20 of their home games in Omaha, which was three hours away by car. It basically meant that the team played 61 road games compared to only 21 true home games. It was not a good idea and Tom did not like it and he made his opinion known. So the Kings traded him to the Philadelphia 76ers at the worst time that anyone could play for the 76ers. That 1972-73 Philadelphia team has the distinction of being the worst team in NBA history. They only won nine games against 73 losses. According to Tom, playing on that team was no fun at all. But surprisingly, the players were able to stay upbeat the entire year and kept working hard. After a couple of years in Philadelphia, Tom moved on to the Atlanta Hawks where he played for coach Cotton Fitzsimmons, who had previously coached Dick in Phoenix. Having coached both of the twins, Fitzsimmons described them as practically the same player. They both worked incredibly hard and had identical skill sets. Back in Phoenix, Dick was part of the 1976 Sun Squad that, against all odds, made it to the NBA Finals against the Boston Celtics. At that point, the Suns had Paul Westfall, Pat Riley, Curtis Perry, and Alvin Adams, that season's Rookie of the Year. Unfortunately, the Suns lost four games to two, but in the stands for every one of those games was Tom cheering on for his brother. Tom was very friendly with the Phoenix Suns players, even celebrating with them a couple of weeks earlier when they won the Western Conference. During his time with the Phoenix Suns, Dick and his wife had really fallen in love with the Phoenix area and decided that they would make Phoenix their permanent home even after Dick retired. Tom had also decided to make Phoenix his home and live there during the offseason for a number of years. Once Tom retired for the NBA, Phoenix would also be his permanent home too. Part of the reason that Tom decided to live in Phoenix with Dick was so that they could start planning their post-playing careers. Back then, even stars had to have a second career after basketball. The NBA of the 1970s provided a nice salary, but not one that could provide for the rest of someone's life. They would need to continue working after basketball. So they both decided to get their license to become stockbrokers and worked as stockbrokers for a summer before deciding that they both hated it. But through a local business connection in Phoenix, the twins decided to get their real estate licenses and begin working in commercial real estate. Now that was something that they both really enjoyed. They would eventually form their own real estate company. However, they were still in the NBA and they had more basketball to play. The Atlanta Hawks wanted to move Tom in a trade. He asked that he be traded to Phoenix so that he could play with Dick. The Atlanta Hawks honored that request and worked something out so that Tom could join the Suns. In their 12th season as NBA players, the Twins were once again teammates. But age was starting to get to them. Both players were now coming off the bench as they could no longer handle starters minutes. Dick averaged 7 points per game and Tom averaged 6 points per game. It was a lot of fun to play together even if they were not the best players on the team anymore as they had been through their entire childhood. They both were retire at the end of that season, which was the 1976-77 season. Tom would announce his retirement near the end of the season so everyone knew it was coming. Dick thought that he would be able to play one more year, but the team had other ideas. They asked Dick to join the front office because they thought he could be of great service in that capacity. But as the final game approached for that season, Dick had an idea. What if they switched jerseys and pulled off the same trick that they did back when they were kids playing Little League Baseball? And Tom would have none of it. He said that this was the NBA, not Little League. It would be wrong, but looking back on it years later, he admitted that it would have been funny to pull it off one more time. So into retirement they went. They started Van Arsdale Properties Incorporated. 
Tom worked on the business full-time, and Dick worked on it part-time as he was also one of the broadcasters for the Phoenix Suns, a position he held for 15 years. Both players averaged exactly 34 minutes per game for their careers. Dick averaged 16 points per game, while Tom averaged 15 points per game. They both also averaged 4 rebounds per game, 3 assists per game, and 3 personal fouls per game. They were both team captains, both were all rookie, and both went to exactly 3 All-Star games. That is about as identical as it gets. The only significant difference in their careers is that Tom holds the record for playing in the most regular season games without ever playing in the playoffs. Tom played 929 career games without playing a single playoff game. No one else is even close. It is a dubious record, but a record nonetheless. In addition to being hard workers, they were equally hard workers in their business. Their real estate business was very successful and they gained a reputation of being businessmen of the highest integrity. They always did right by the client and dealt with everybody fairly. As of this episode, they are both 79 years old, still living in Phoenix, and still getting in as many rounds of golf as they can. As I researched this story, one idea kept hitting me over and over. These two guys really love each other. It must have been nice to be raised with your best friend and for that friendship to last nearly 80 years. We should all be that blessed. Well, that is the story of the Van Arsdale twins, Tom and Dick, brothers through and through. Join us next time when we share the story of when Isaiah Thomas scored 25 points in a single quarter on a severely sprained ankle in an NBA Finals game. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that'll help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row One brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at Check out and keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh, yes,